You're watching Drake Wing Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys and gals, Nary, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. It's something on Twitter, the gaming drag. Today I'm coming back at another Let's Play episode of Dawn Tide Griff's Path. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump right back in, shall we? Alarm chain, you are up, and let's go. Griff, that was like 70 sterling. For a salad and some wine. Hm, only with the tip. You guys don't tip enough here. Hey, I tip. But we actually pay waitstaff a uh, waitstaff a proper wage here, so so you don't want to get good tips at the cafe? I didn't say that. He smirks, eyeing his watch. Afraid to say, I've got a busy afternoon coming. This was nice, though. I'm sorry things got a bit uh weird at the end. Riley, he places a hand on my shoulder and brings something out from his back pocket. Here, a napkin. A phone number is written on it. I'd be happy to do this again, but if you have any other ideas, let me know. You're the creative one, after all. I take the napkin in my hand. Hold on to it as tight as you can. I'll text you mine. Look forward to it. I'll see you soon, Riley. Griff waves and disappears up a thin, hilly street. I fold the napkin into my wallet and just stand there for a while. How did I pull that off? No sounds in the flat. It's all sows out already. I scroll idly on my phone as I put the coffee pot back in the cupboard. There are a few notifications on Prowler. No point replying to any of them at this time of day, though. I feel a bit weird doing that right after seeing Griff, too. I lay back on the sofa, looking up to the ceiling. Patchy orange paint. Proper half-assed landlord job. What to do, then? I could call it Joe Ranzo, I suppose. Ranzo said he wanted to... Ow! Something sharp in your back! Standing up, I pull open the sofa cushions to find the cause. Ah! I pull a hardback book from between the pillows. On the cover, a goat in plain robe stands serenely with his eyes closed as a blurry city crowd passes around him. An old-fashioned font spells out profit margins, business secrets of the Mrs. Business Secrets of the Merchian Monks. Looks serious. Looks boring. Read. I thumb through a random page. Study of the specialist self has long been a core tenet of Merchianism. It was initiated by the selfless land labor of Saint Land Labor of Saint Ju Saint Just. It's embodied by the monks who cloistered themselves as a way to conduct rigorous replication of an individual song. The specialized oneself is to become a mirror of Mercia's composite, a small and finely tuned foot soldier of his of his myriad. Some consider modernity to tear us from this path. It demands both parents work while raising children. Beyond that, it demands constant development of new skills in an ever-changing technological landscape. It then demands that we fit prayer into the thin gaps between these burdens. Gone are the days of the man who fulfills community role with precision and sets time aside for God after. The baker, the watchmaker, the plowman. However, I would argue that the pressures of the modern world challenge us to carve out space in novel ways. There you go. Hmm. In a world where everyone is a generalist, the specialist can shine above them, so long as his niche is carved appropriately. In filling this role, the specialist can not only accelerate his career, but become closer to God through it. I can see why Sal didn't like this. I turn to the inside of the back cover. In bitmap black and white, the author sits for his photograph, small spectacles balanced on a bulbous river otter snout. His brows are held high with pride. Written by Dr. M.J. Pritchard, published by... Butcher's Pub... Pub... Blah. Published by Dorlish Folden, 1995. I fold the book under my arm and knock it on Sal's bedroom door. Definitely out. Probably at her mum's already. I try to give her a call. Rings out. She doesn't like going to her parents that much. It'd be good to save her another visit. I spin my phone between a finger and thumb in the quiet room. Not much else going on, I suppose. Oh, that's pretty. A thick skin of ivy covers the stone walls around me. The shadows of a great sycamore make the driveway feel like a tunnel. The Roseville family have gone to great lengths to keep this small patch of land to themselves. Even with the gates open, it sends a signal. This is our fortress. We will allow you only as a guest. The overgrowth of the path gives way to a, grave, to a graveled area. Carefully preened rose bushes mark the edges of the old house, leading round to a tall wooden fence. The garden is the most private place of all. Two cars stand beside it. The first is compact and angular with a high roof, pale orange. It looks modest at first glance until you notice how well it's been kept been kept for a car of its age. It's simple but sturdy. It wouldn't look out of place in the backdrop of a 70s detective film. A badge on the back reads, Caro Metro. The second car makes more of a statement. 
It's older. Finer. Sunlight drips over the rippled air vents of the curved bonnet, painted in deep, doorless racing green. Its wheel bear spokes around a three-pointed propeller motif. A soft convertible roof lays back, meaning a small trunk about large enough for a single suitcase. Chrome metal piping runs along its edges. The steering wheel looks to be wooden. Looks to be wooden. There's no text to be seen, but the, fourth, but the front bonnet bears the statuesque figure leaping forward. I remember seeing this parked at school. Mrs. Ro Mr. Roosevelt's car. You don't think he's in, do you? I grind through the gravel up to the darkened wooden door. The house isn't particularly large, but everything around it makes it feel like a grand mansion. The door knocker hangs between two broad, time-worn brass antlers. The cold weight of the metal makes me feel like I'm some orphan come to beg for asylum. The silence after feels intrusive. An instinct in my chest tells me to turn back down the path, like a little boy playing knock-knock ginger. I keep the book tucked firm under my arm. I wait. Knock again. Sal, are you? The metal slips from my fingers as the door pulls inward. A lied figure stands stiff against the dull amber glow, all dull amber light of the hallway. <laughs> oh, oh! Good afternoon, Mister Coates. I must say I wasn't expecting you. Sorry. Um. Uh, me neither, Mrs. Rosevale. My thumb drifts on the cover of the book. I want to bring it up, but words are difficult. The old doe smile is an envelope thin, sealed with a sharp tongue. Her eyebrows raise, the shadow cast by her sockets falling on dusty eyeshadow. Looking for Sally, perhaps? Yes, also, before I can bring up the book, she gestures to her side. Please, come in. My feet move before my thoughts. Sally's just... upstairs at the moment. I don't suppose I could interest you in a spot of afternoon tea. When somebody of this class offers you tea, you don't turn it down. It's a peace offering. Sal so probably want to go as soon as she can. Don't keep her around drinking tea with her mom. Plus, the tea they have is probably that old, dusty old stuff. Which is why you should have some. Get used to it. You're not a kid. Except, yes, I'll have some tea. Thank you. Three sugars, please. Of course. Her smile broadens, eyelids lower. Of course? Was that a judgment? I'm sure she was saying, of course, I'll make that for you now. It definitely was a judgment. Three sugars. As she turns, I remember. Oh, and one other thing. I hold out the book. I Sal meant to return this, but she couldn't find it this morning. She takes the book slowly, turning it over in her hands. No, oh, I do hope she found it helpful for her business. I would love to see it become a little more lucrative for her. Searching for a response, I can't help but let her words hang. Her eyes pinch for a moment, cheeks lifting. Let me get that tea ready for you. Thank you for returning this for her. As Gwyneth trots down the hall, I untie my boots by the door, placing them beside a few pairs of shoes, all cloven at the tip. They're plain, yet finely crafted, well shined with a three-inch heel. A similar design in varying colors. Sal's scuffed, once-white basketball trainer sit at, the end of the sit at the end of the procession line. I pace quietly down the hall towards the living room. Lining the walls are photographs and silhouettes of relatives past, a wintry forest of antlers. There's a notable absence at the end of the line, a space held for the family's current patriarch, Arthur Rosevale. The clock in the headmaster's office always seems to stick, uh, tick low, slower than the others. It's a space of apprehension. But the room itself holds nothing foreboding. Being there usually means you've done something wrong. Until this point, I'd only been here when I'd gotten too tied up in one of Joe's and Billy's class, class clown double acts. This time was more severe. Everything smells of iron. My nose bloody. Lukewarm water soaks the collar of my uniform. The ice pack pressed to my temple hadn't been replaced in over an hour. Better than nothing. The hit wasn't too bad, but having both my parents here isn't helping the headache. Mr. and Mrs. Coates, I apologize for calling you in on such short notice. My mum's northern accent speaks in soft contrast to my father's punchy, southwesterly gruffness. Her hand rests firmly on my shoulder. Flecks of red beneath it. This music's really good. It's alright. We understand. It wasn't the best timing, but... Above my head, I can feel my mom's glance snap towards my father. But this is serious. Can you tell us what happened? Mr. Rosevale stiffens his back. I've heard accounts from Mr. Mully and from your son and from Lee Boscawen, who I understand is the boy who initiated the falling out. Isn't that right, Riley? I nod my head. Neck stiff. 
I know how the story develops. Riley's told us about Lee before. Council House boy. Not surprised. Oh, Jesus. Dad! Am I wrong? That letter always causing you trouble. Joe's in a council house and he's okay. Joe Crofty, the Kestrel boy? You're in year eight and he's already going through a pack a day. Jacob, please. The tension in my mom's hand stiffens, then releases as she looks back to me. I know he's your friend, Riley, but we do think Joe is maybe... Not the best person to be hanging around with. Did he have something to do with this? She turns to the stag. He waves his hand loosely. We're aware of Joe's behavior. We can be a distraction for Riley, but this issue doesn't concern him. Carry on, then. What happened? The thick upholstery of the headmaster's chair creaks as he leans back. The shadows of his broad antlers climb the wall like vines. Between art and history lessons today, around 11, an argument broke out between Lee and Riley. Lee says he didn't start it, but, well, he gives a knowing glance to my father, acknowledging his earlier claim. It's understood that Lee made a rather crude remark about Riley and, what did he say? I won't repeat the exact wording, but, no, what did he say? It is important. Well, to get to that, get in that, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Riley then wrote, he called me a faggot. Tension on my shoulders rise. Dad looks at me for the first time since he entered the room. Riley! What? It's what he said! <clears throat> yes, well, whatever what was said was... What else did he say? I shrug. Stuff about if I, su if I suck dick, take it up the ass, wear a girl's underwear. My father shakes his head. I'm not sure if it's at, if it's at the words themselves or the fact that they were leveled at me. Thank you, Riley. And we'll discuss what was said later. He leans forward again, elbows on the mahogany desk. This then prompted Riley to retaliate physically. Riley punched him. What? The hand lifts from my shoulder. I sink lower in the rough plastic chair. We taught you better than that. We don't hit people because they were rude to you. No, in this case, you should have. All eyes, including mine, turned to my father. Jacob, you can't be serious. Sorry, love, but if a bloke called me that, I'd knock his bloody teeth out. People like that Boscoin lad need a lesson or they'll act like that all their life. Mr. Rosevale writes something in a notebook. Oh what, Arthur? Are you gonna going on? Going to go all politically correct on me? Though I understand the response, Mr. Coates, that doesn't make it right. Children do tend to fight at this age, but Riley is usually a good boy. His response was out of the ordinary. Hmm. Children? So patronizing. So if it's normal for a boy to act up, it gets brushed off, but if a good one retaliates, it's not. I assure you, Riley isn't isn't in very much trouble. We've given him some detention, but that's not the reason you've been called in. Detention away from Lee, I hope? Yes. As you can see, Riley wasn't the only one to strike a blow. It had to get broken up by Mr. Mullion. The detention will be separate. What I'd like to talk about is the reason why your son has received this kind of attention. Go on. Are you familiar with the sort of clothing Riley and has been wearing on non-school uniform days? What do you mean? Well, on one occasion he wore these sort of... Fishnet glove sort of things. He runs his hand from wrist to elbow. Most recently, he came to school in a girl's skirt. He what? I assume my father is looking at me now. I'm busy tracing the patterns in the linoleum floor. He was asked to change back into trousers, which he did. There was a fair bit of name calling, but nothing we thought would be worth bringing you in over. There must be some kind of mistake. He doesn't wear that sort of thing at home. Non school uniform days are there to give students a chance to express themselves, but this is exactly why I personally oppose them. It invites too much opportunity for disagreement. My father exhales slowly. I keep tra tracing the interlocking lines around my feet. There's also the matter of his area of focus in art lessons. I'll pause it right there, y'all. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and check out our Patreon if you can. It always helps. Before I go, I'm going to give a quick shout-out to our lovely bronze tier patrons. Thank y'all if I do for the channel. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you to our silver tier patron, Cade Silver, and thank you for going a bit above and beyond. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks to our two gold tier patrons, Zeke and Toby. Y'all are awesome. We love you. Thank you for subbing to Ultimate Tier. Anyway, if y'all want to get your names in the credits, get access to all of our not safe for more contents as little as $5. Alrighty, I love you all, and I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye bye